La primera charla de hoy lleva por título Mucho, muy poco, público y museos. Este es un tema que se ha tratado, eh, eh, digamos que es, que es un problema eh, en la mayoría de los museos en los que uno trabaja y es cómo atraer más público. Pero hay algunos museos muy grandes que tienen el otro problema y es, tienen mucho público y no saben cómo eh, manejar ese público para eh, poderle dar una experiencia significativa, puesto que el, el, eh, casi que peor que no tener a nadie es tener demasiadas personas que dañan la experiencia para los que quieren tener realmente, eh, digamos, una relación mucho más íntima con el arte. Pero aquí no, finalmente, en, entre los tres invitados que tenemos, no hay eh, el caso de hordas de público, así que fuimos cambiando un poco el, el tema para hablar de cómo se agarra al público, cómo se, eh, se lo involucra en una experiencia más significativa. A mi izquierda está Lian Sacramón, es curadora de la Fundación Cartier en París, uno de los espacios más importantes de Europa para la investigación sobre el arte contemporáneo y sus múltiples referencias, conexiones y antecedentes. Está como muy duro el, el micrófono, queda como muy brillante. Okay. Ha curado exposiciones tan diversas como América Latina 1960-2013, una exposición importantísima, que realmente muy importante y, y particularmente en Colombia la sentimos muy importante, puesto que eh, tenía muchos artistas colombianos, y, no, y digo artistas y no fotógrafos, a pesar de que la exposición era eh, eh, de fotografía. Eh, una muestra de fotografía del continente desde una perspectiva muy amplia e incluyente. También Transform, que fue una exposición que tuve la oportunidad de ver hace un tiempo, dedicada al dibujante y creador de mundos, Moebius, una figura de culto no solo en Francia, sino para todo ello, todos aquellos interesados en lo que llaman allí Bond de Cine, que en español llamamos historieta con un nombre un poco banalizante. Y eh, también Los Tesoros de Vodou, que incluía esculturas y máscaras de los ritos del antiguo culto religioso en Benin, África. Aquí a mi derecha está Christine Bart es curadora de la colección fotográfica del Museo du Quai Branly en París, en donde está a cargo de las adquisiciones y de una colección de más de 700.000 ítems, además de la curaduría de exposiciones. Christine ha organizado en varias ocasiones el programa de residencias de Foto Que, la Bienal de Fotografía del Quai Branly. En el 2014 curó la exposición eh, Nocturne de Colombie, Image Contemporaine, que incluyó a la obra de artistas colombianos como Óscar Muñoz y Juan Manuel Echavarría, entre otros. Entre sus exposiciones recientes se puede mencionar Yucatán está en otra parte, Expediciones fotográficas de Desiree Charnet en el 2007, Cámara Oscura también en ese año y Patagonia, Imágenes del fin del mundo en el 2012, entre muchas otras. A mi extrema derecha está Miguel Ríos, que es el director y curador de la Fundación Leal Ríos en Lisboa, Portugal. Miguel, formado como diseñador, es codirector, junto con su hermano Manuel, de la Fundación Leal Ríos en Lisboa, como ya dije, y es además curador de la Fundación. Durante más de 12 años, los hermanos Leal Ríos han conformado una colección de arte contemporáneo internacional, en la cual se han enfocado en coleccionar a profundidad la obra de los artistas que escogen, de tal manera que no tienen solamente muchos artistas, sino muchas obras eh, de cada artista para poder ver en profundidad su cuerpo de trabajo. La fundación fue creada en el 2012 e incluye obras de artistas portugueses, pero ampliando rápidamente hacia artistas internacionales con el fin de contextualizar sus prácticas en un ámbito más global. Entonces, más, los dejo con Diane eh, Sacarmón, que va a hablar de, eh, de su trabajo en la Fundación Cartier. De, solo quiero decir, para aquellos que requieran traducción simultánea inglés-español o español-inglés, puesto que ellos van a hablar todos en inglés, en la parte de atrás están audífonos eh, que pues, les pueden entregar. Gracias. First of all, thank you, Jose, for inviting me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah? Uh, and also thank you for mentioning uh, the America Latina exhibition and Moibus as well, because I'm not going to have much time to talk about them during this presentation. Um, I really chose um, examples of, um, that illustrate the title of my 
presentation because this is about the public and um, the public of the foundation, the institution and its public. I call my presentation Reaching Out to an Eclectic Audience because uh, the Fondation Cartier does not just address an audience that's interested specifically in contemporary ar art, but also reaches out to a much wider audience with other fields of interest through a programming which I could probably best describe as, as boundary breaking. So this will become clearer as I go along, but first I'd like to give you a brief overview of, of our activities so that you better understand who we are and what we do. So we were founded in 1984 uh, by the famous jewelry company Cartier, and we were the very first corporate foundation devoted to contemporary art in, created in France. Actually, the laws of France regarding corporate funding of the arts actually had to be changed in order to accommodate our existence at the time. And for the first 10 years, we were located outside of Paris. And in 1994, we moved into this beautiful glass building designed by Jean Nouvel, which was really a monument of contemporary architecture in Paris. Many people come to visit us just to see the building. Um, many people think we occupy the whole building, but we're actually only on three floors. The first two floors are our exhibition spaces, and they're about 1,200 square meters, so we're a relatively small foundation. And our offices are occupy one floor only, and the rest of the floors are devoted to offices, corporate offices for Cartier. Uh, although a small portion of our activities are self-funded, all of our funding comes from Cartier. But despite this, we've kept true to one of our founding principles, which is always to keep artists that we work with, they're independent from the corporate in image of Cartier. We'll never ask an artist to design a piece of jewelry or a bag for Cartier. We've always kept that very independent. And I divide our activities into three major realms. First of all, um, our exhibitions and catalogs. We can do thematic or solo shows. Here I'm showing you an example of, of our most, um, this was our all-time blockbuster success in terms of exhibition, Ron Weck, which um, attracted 300,000 visitors and then traveled to three institutions in Latin America, the Proa Foundation, Mam Rio, and the Pinacoteca of Sao Paulo, where, they were, where it was equally successful in all three institutions. And each of our exhibitions are accompanied by a catalog. And um, this catalog um, is accompanied by essays by Justin Patton and Bob Storr. And it won a prize in 2003, the Catalpa Prize, 2013, sorry. Second realm of activities is our collection. And um, our collection brings together about 1,300 works of art. And our acquisitions are almost always related to, um, to our programming. 800 of the works in our collection, in fact, are commissions. We, we, have, we commission works very often in, at the foundation as a way of supporting artists. Um, and because of the nature of our building, which isn't a, a white box space, artists love to work with that space in very specific ways. So a lot of the pieces in our collection are monumental. Here's a piece we commissioned in the year 2000 from Sarah Z, and, uh, who's an American sculptor who represented the U.S., the Venice Biennial, a few years ago. And this, um, this is a very beautiful piece in our collection. We often, because most, a lot of pieces in our collection are monumental in size, we don't often have the opportunity to show them in our space. We practically never show our collection, uh, apart from abroad or through loans. And we, the only time, the only exception to this was um, last year was our 30th anniversary, and we organized a show called Vivid Memories, where over several months we rotated pieces of our collection in our spaces. And here you see a beautiful piece by Pena Marenko and uh, quite a few pieces from our photography collection. We did a specific photography hanging for that exhibition. And our third realm of activity are the nomadic nights. Well, we, I should call these ephemeral, more generally ephemeral events that we organize in our spaces. And we first organized this series of nomadic nights in 1994 when we moved into the building. And they're performing arts events of basically any kind. Uh, they can be uh, poetry readings, uh, concerts, um, theater. 
or they can, we can also give carte blanche to a specific artist. And here you have a few examples of performances we've done in the past. We could have very well-known artists like the saxophonist Archie Shep, who loves coming to the foundation. He's come a few times. Um, we had a very kind of interesting and funny performance by the Ukulele Orchestra of Great Britain a few months ago. And here uh, there's a carte blanche on top of the image on top. Uh, by m the filmmaker Marie Lozier, whom we invited um, to do um, to imagine her own nomadic night at the foundation, and she invited um, a catch wrestler, a Mexican drag queen catch wrestler, to do a catch wrestling performance at the at the Fondation Cartier. That was a big success, actually. <laughs> so, oh, sorry, I forgot. This last, this last, um, this, but this is more recent. We've started to organize a series of conferences at the Fondation Cartier we call Nights of Uncertainty. Often we, we don't know ourselves what's going to happen during these conferences. And this was um, a conference we did, I guess the best translation would be the Night of Honey, where we explored the world of bees and we invited um, the mathematician Cedric Villani, who gave a brief presentation about bees, he's a mathematician, and he mediated this event. And we brought together a biologist, an artist, and beekeeper, and a philosopher to talk about the world of bees. And then afterwards, we organized um, a tasting session of different types of honeys from around the world. Now, to get to the topic of, of the foundation in its public, First of all, I'd like to say we're, again, we're a small foundation, but we welcome a very respectable number of visitors, especially when compared to other Parisian institutions of the same size. On average, I would say approximately 200,000 visitors yearly, on a yearly basis. As I mentioned earlier, we've succeeded in distinguishing ourselves and we've forged our identity through a programming that's very eclectic and multidisciplinary in nature. And because of this variety in our programming, we discovered something very interesting about our public, that for each exhibition, 50% of our visitors are actually newcomers who have never visited the foundation. So I've chosen just a few examples of exhibitions we've organized at the foundation to, to sort of illustrate why this is the case. So this is an exhibition we organized in 2009, 2010, called Born in the Streets Graffiti. And it occupied the entire gallery space in addition to the garden and the facade where we had graffiti artists come and intervene on our facade. And we trace in this exhibition, we trace the artistic development of the contemporary graffiti, of contemporary graffiti from its birth in New York City in the 1970s to um, the worldwide phenomenon it is today. And this exhibition brought in a completely new public to the foundation. Um, young people from the suburbs of Paris who don't often visit museums, either because they live far from the city center or because they're not familiar with contemporary art. This exhibition, Native Land Stop Eject, uh, was curated by the urbanist Paul Virilio and the French filmmaker and photographer Raymond de Pardon. And this exhibition explored the concept of native land and of what it means to be rooted and uprooted in a world uh, facing the challenges uh, brought on by mass migration, globalization, and climate change. And in this slide, you can see two important works we helped to produce specifically for this exhibition. On the right is a film uh, uh, by Raymond de Pardon entitled Hear Them Speak, where, um, where Raymond de Pardon traveled around the world to interview threatened minorities whose languages and cultures are rapidly disappearing. And on the left is a project that Paul Virilio developed with the architects Diller and Scafidio, which is an immersive circular map that displays continuously updated data on population shifts, remittances, political refugees, and rising seas. And this piece is called Exit, and it's now a part of our collection, and we're going to be showing it at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris during the co conference climate that will take place in Paris at the end of the year. So as you can imagine, this exhibition didn't just bring in a public interested in contemporary art, it also brought in um, a new audience interested in questions related to migration, sustainable development, 
um, many social scientists and students of the social sciences and people who work in governmental entities, NGOs. And for the exhibition, this is a, another exhibition, Mathematics, a Beautiful Elsewhere, where we brought together world-renowned mathematicians, Field Prize winners, Cedric Villani, whom I talked about just a bit earlier, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon and Misha Gromov to work with artists uh, such as the Japanese photographer Hiroshi Sujimoto, the Brazilian artist Beatrice Miazes, or the filmmaker David Lynch in an attempt to render visible the very abstract and conceptual world of mathematics. And I'd really like to talk to you about the robotics piece on the right, but I don't think I have the time. <laughs> and this is the show we have on, currently on view. It's called Bote Congo, Congo Kitoko, which is a show about um, artistic production in the Congo from 1926 to the present. It includes painting, sculpture, photography, and music. And this exhibition clearly brought to the foundation a whole new audience of visitors of African origin who, who are very enthusiastic about the show because it gives a very positive image of, of, of the Congo. This is the Democratic Republic of, Republic of the Congo. And this is also this, this um, interest of, of, African pub, of the African public is also reflected on our Facebook page where we now have acquired 50,000 new fans from Kinshasa. So since I'm talking about Facebook, hold on, I'll talk about that later, but I just would like to say two words because one area of development and focus in recent years has been to expand our digital audience via our website and other social networks. And we've worked hard to redo our website, and it's now the third most visited website after the Louvre and the Centre Pompidou in Paris. And we're very present and extremely active on 10 social networks and have a total of 500,000 followers on all of these networks combined. And, and this is maybe because we, we develop specific content for our website for each exhibition. We commission art projects or we produce our own films and interviews. And this is a project we, we developed with a, um, a Congolese comic strip artist, Papa Mfumu Eto, the first. And he's doing um, comic strips on a, on a on a um, weekly basis for, for our website that you can see right now until, until the month of November. How am I doing time-wise, Jose? Okay. Okay. So how do we welcome visitors at the Fondation Cartier? Well, one thing that's very specific about the way we welcome visitors, visitors is we don't have um, security guards in the, the usual sense of the term. We recruit a team of gallery attendants who are both guardians in the gallery spaces and they're also well-informed tour guides. And the staff is usually composed of graduate students uh, from different disciplines. They could be mathematicians for the mathematic exhibition, anthropologists for the native land show. And they're spe specifically trained to give guided tours for each exhibition and actively inform visitors, go towards visitors when they, wake, when they come into the foundation to make them feel welcome. And in addition to offering guided tours um, of our temporary exhibitions for adults as well as families, we also program really interesting hands-on workshops for children that are related thematically to the exhibition on view. And this slide shows a recent workshop we organized for the Congo exhibition. We're also developing new ways of welcoming the public in our garden. The garden of the Fondation Cartier is a very special place in the neighborhood. It's a place where many families come to relax. It's a really beautiful garden. And it also has historical significance because it was, in the 19th century, the home of the novelist Chateaubriand. And the cedar tree he planted, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it here to show you. The cedar tree he planted um, uh, almost 200 years ago, still grows right in front of the foundation. And the whole building of Jean Nou Nouvelle was actually designed around this cedar tree. Now the garden is a work by the Swiss artist um, Lothar Baumgarten, whom we commissioned in 1992 to design the landscape. And in 2012, we initiated a study of our garden with scientists from the Museum of Natural History in Paris and discovered that it's the home to 1,500 different species of plants and animals. 
And now, twice per month, following these children's workshops, we actually organize visits of the garden with scientists um, from the Museum of Natural History so, so that the children can discover the incredible biodiversity of, a, of our garden. And we actually have a, a beautiful website, um, web page devoted to our garden now. That's new. And the last thing I wanted to say, because I wasn't able to talk about it, um, we will be, I can't come to Bogota without mentioning the fact that next year in February, we're going to be showing the work of Fernando Franco, the photo Colombian photographer from Cali. Um, and this just reflects our continued interest in the um, work of artists from Latin America, as Jose mentioned. Two years ago, we did a show called America Latina, which brought together 70 artists from 11 different countries in Latin America. So that's about it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, OK. OK, thank you, Leanne. And thank you, Jose, for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Is the game? Okay. Come on. <laughs> okay. Let's start. So I'm creator for photography collection in the Musée de Kibonli. We have uh, many many things in common with uh, the Fondation Cartier. Maybe the the first thing is to have a um, a common architect. Oh, see. So just uh, a few pictures to introduce the, the museum, which is the newest museum in, in Paris. We opened in 2006. Um, so at the Formation Cartier, we have a, um, a building uh, conceived in a, in a huge garden. And um, it's a quite different building. But just um, a few a few pictures to show you that it's not um, it's not a museum really defined as a con not a contemporary art museum, not really as an art museum, and nor as an ethnographic museum. It's something mixed under these different uh, different fields. It means that it um, it allows us to to present different exhibition. Uh, for example, on the right you may see La Fabrique des Images. Uh, which was uh, an exhibition created with a, a French anthropologist, Philippe Descola, about the representation of the, of the world um, in different parts of the world. And um, on, the, on the back, you may see an exhibition dedicated to the, the history of the human zoo. And the, the exhibition was created by uh, Lilian Thuram, a football player and a curator too. So we used to have different kind of exhibition with different curators. And just um, a picture of the permanent display, just to insist on the fact that we are not a, a white cube and we can pretend to be a white cube. Oops. So in this, um, in this place, um, I wanted to talk about this exhibition that I, I created two, two years ago um, as a, maybe a case study. This was um, one of the first uh, exhibitions really dedicated to contemporary art, presenting this um, great artist from Colombia. And um, we had at the time um, a challenge to, um, to present the work and to imagine to what kind of people, what kind of public we were talking about. So just a few pictures to show you how the, the exhibition was designed. These are the works of Juan Manuel Echevarria by Miguel Angel Rojas. Ah, si. By Jose Alejandro Restrepo and by Oscar Munoz. And um, so the question was to what kind, kind of public we were talking. And I expected to have a um, French public. And um, I expected that this public doesn't know mm, actually nothing about Colombia, about country art in Colombia. And um, so I decided to organize the, the information which was necessary for the French public in different levels. 
and um, with different um, different techniques. I mean, we had uh, we made a, such a huge work on the written documentation, but I organized the label in the in the way that the people um, has to see the pieces before seeing the labels, because I feel important that the. The, the French people who probably doesn't know anything about Colombia only know um, things related to the bad reputation of the country. And uh, I thought it was very important that the people may um, understand the pieces by themselves to have first an idea of what they were looking at. And after that, be able to have also the information related to the pieces, but also related to the social and political situation that the, the pieces were talking about. Um, so, with, uh, within the exhibition, um, we, have, um, we were lo very lucky to have, a, at that time, a Peruvian student who made a very special study about the public. And she organized different uh, interviews during the exhibition and um, asked uh, to the people different questions about their knowledge about Latin American art and uh, about what they were looking at in the exhibition. And um, we realized at that moment that uh, the public who went and see the exhibition has to, to face with many two or three difficulties. The main um, question was the geographical distance. What about Colombia, which is a very far away uh, country? We don't know about the history. The second step was, what is country art? And maybe the third step was, is it country art related to the history? So we, um, we organized this um, different level of information, um, also in the idea of avoiding the exoticism, um, exoticism about the, the country, but also the exoticism um, of the violence, of the representation of the violence. And finally, one of the surprises of the, the exhibition uh, was that uh, we had quite a French public also, but we had um, many, many Colombian public, actually. And uh, when we read the, the guest books, I realized that many, many of the comments were made by Colombian people. I, actually, the most part of the, the guest book is written in Spanish. And um, so it was very interesting to realize that it, it was a different question about the representation of the Colombia through country art and country art talking about history of Colombia. I mean that uh, we realized that for uh, a part of the French public, the main difficulty was to understand how to go on in a country art uh, exhibition in a museum where they didn't know exactly if it was possible to have a country art exhibition. And, um, this difficulty, we, we find also the same with part of the Colombian public. I mean, part of the comments in the guest book were based on what kind of image is it? And um, it was very clear that for a part of the people and part of the Colombian public who has um, a very good knowledge about art, they were, of course, very able to go inside and very proud to have this exhibition, and for uh, a different part of the Colombian public, we, who don't um, used to be to go in country art uh, exhibition, they very often ask, "Is it a good image of the Colombia?" So it was very interesting to compare, and um, we can uh, we could uh, compare the two kind of uh, of reaction, and so. Um, there were, um, I mean, the guest book is a very interesting uh, tool to, to observe all these kind of reaction, because finally, um, I didn't expect that uh, many parts of the French public, and especially um, people not really concerned by country art, could um, appreciate the exhibition. And finally, it was one of the surprises that see many, to see many people, and probably sometimes, mm, 
really people very far away from contemporary art who suddenly realize and understand things about history through the exhibition and through the pieces. And, um, and I remember that one of the, the comments we were very funny to, to read in a guest book was written by a, um, a Colombian um, man, probably someone very um, involved in, uh, in a world of art and who knows the pieces. And uh, he, was, uh, he was commenting uh, a piece by, uh, by José Alejandro Restrepo, um, oops, which was the uh, El Caballero de la Fe, which was uh, actually the most commented piece in the guest book by, by um, different public. And uh, he said, OK, this is a very important work. This is fantastic, etc. But what will the French people may understand about this? <laughs> So it was interesting also to, to realize that the pieces were asking questions to the different part of the public, and this public was expecting other reaction from the other part of the public. Um, so um, many, many interesting things to study from this experience. And actually, I learned a lot with uh, this, um, this work, working in this exhibition, and working on the reaction of the public. And um, one, one of the part of the public also was the reaction of the anthropologist. But maybe this is another story, and um, that's oh, all. Yes, thank you. Hello, thank you, Christine, thank you, Leanne, and thank you, jo Jose, for, inv for inviting me. And uh, I start my presentation um, saying that we are a small foundation. We are uh, collectors, my brother and I, and we have a small foundation. And I present, I started with this I, and this I is going to follow us during this presentation until another piece that will be the end of the presentation. This piece um, is the last one that we achieved for our collection and it's the act of seeing and its relation to desire as a potential economic force is materialized in a video loop depicting and blinking eye from Andre, by André Romão. No. Does it work, the arrows? Oh, we need the... Oh, So the Alrich Foundation is a Portuguese institution gov governed by private law whose main goals are the dissemination, up upkeep, preservation and promotion of works and artists present in the contemporary art collection, which my brother Manuel, who is the president of the foundation, and I have assembled over the last 14 years. Located in Lisbon, in a space specifically adapted for this purpose, the public will be able to view the collection through the temporary exhibitions, events, and publications. The Leal Rich Foundation program also includes additional learning activities to support a better understanding and appreciation of both national and international art fair. So, what I want to, to, to show you again is what is the public? The public is some, somehow someone that goes to assist to see and so is going to use all the sense all um, the eye the sense of the touch everything to understand a piece of art and so that's why I, st I continue to put this eye because art does not live unless it, it, it is enjoyed the Leal Rich Foundation opens its doors to give the city of Lisbon and all who visit in the opportunity to discover its collection, which includes works by some of the most renowned and also some of the best up and coming Portuguese and foreign artists of today. Yes, yes, it's a, yeah, thank you, thank you. At a difficult moment for Portugal and the rest of the world, we intend to share this project 
seeking to keep the spirit of initiative alive, believing that the creative power of the works that comprise the Leal Rich Foundation collection will surely bring to Lisbon and the country as a whole another view of the relationship that can be established between art, artists, and the role of the collector with different publics. I'm showing some pictures of our, in a, in a, of our space. Artists, curators, collectors, or owners of art galleries, other individualities from Portuguese and international art institutions, nurture and support enormous effort we make. So, because of the public growing interest in visiting the, our exhibitions, the Alvish Foundation opens its doors three days a week to the public instead of the traditional visit by appoint appointment only. Each exhibition had at least 300 visitors, with the Helena Almeida, the Portuguese conceptual artist, exhibition reaching seven, 700 visitors. We have a library with more than 9,000 books related with art and design. At the end of, two, of 2016, we will be able to open this library for public consultation with the online searching through the International Europeana and art.libraries.net search portals. What I want to say is you use all the tools to communicate. Books, we achieve all the books from the artists that we have in our collection all the publications, all the publications in newspapers. And with this, we try to communicate with the world, trying to bring up the public to us, uh, even with this, the library, the collection, and our, um, our participation in several uh, international, uh, international exhibitions around the world, uh, learning some uh, art of pieces of our collection. And now I'm going to... Also, these are other images. These are some of the storage rooms that we open to the public. They are never closed to the public. And now I'm going to speak about one of the exhibitions that we have, and it was very interesting regarding the, the public that we have there. Becky Beasley exhibition, The Man Nobody Could Lift. In line with the Foundation's objectives, a selection of 11 works by British artist Becky Beasley from the car collection was presented. In addition, the Alrich Foundation commissioned a site-specific work from the assets that would complement this group and demonstrate the development of the artist's work. The sum of these works comprise the exhibition The Man Nobody Could Lift, which is an undeniable Becky Pizzi's first major exhibition outside of the United Kingdom. The exhibition has generated interest from international curators and institutions, thus demonstrating the strong impact the artist already has on the international contemporary art scene. This is another exhibition from Ilan Almeida. Ilan Almeida is already 80 years old now, and is, he was one of the most important artists of the 60s in Portugal. She's now really rediscovered really by the art world, and um, she is commonly understood from the critical relationship that her work establishes with painting or by enhancing the self-representational nature of a work or even from an emphasis on the performative char character apparent in her images. Now she's going to going on tour, as I say, because she's going to be at Serralves in Porto, Jeu de Pomme Paris, Ville Centre d'Art Contemporain Bruxelles, Pinacoteca de São Paulo in 2016, and at the end at the Art Institute of Chicago. She's really being discovered. Benoit Marie Morisseau and Nicolas Millier, French artists, and with uh, this first exhibition of two artists making a dialogue. The future is but the opposite in reverse. Both pieces in the present exhibition, The Shape of Things to Come, La Brianti Tomique at Atomique by Benoit Marie Morisseau and uh, Mortrière, sorry, this one, by Nicolas Millet, evo evoke the lugubrious architecture of uh, abandoned fortifications 
defensive walls and island shelters that once constituted the Atlantic wall of the Maginot Line. Like minimal sculptures, both pieces, much the same as bunkers, convey a mood of vast immobility which hangs in the balance between the human and the geolo geolo geological time scale. And here I'm going just to present, this is a publicity that we made in Art Forum, in the international magazines, around, uh, uh, well, the international art magazines, because it's another communication that we have to do. If you want to be in the world and not only in Lisbon and for Lisbon, we have to promote our institution and our artists uh, in the international magazines. This uh, was the first big uh, group show um, that works from the, 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 the Leal Rich Foundation collection. And it was made by different authors from different generations and nationalities face each other in the exhibition space of the Leal Rich Foundation. Maybe if you belong to the art field, you know who is Lawrence Wiener, Alan Sekula, Matt Mulligan, Anthony McCall. They are big, big names. But who is Adelina Lopes or even Max Fry? Maybe you don't know. That's why my work there as a curator, even I'm not a curator, I'm a collector, but I'm the one that chooses the pieces and makes this contextualization of the art pieces and the artists. The, way, the thing that I, we want to do is to contextualize emergent artists with the big names to put them to 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 engage all of them and uh, to promote the young artists and even the Portuguese ones. So this exhibition focuses on language and how language can relate and question reality. As the earth spins beneath the stars brought together a set of post-conceptual and some docum documental works where different media such as photography, video, painting, sculpture, drawing, light, motion, the language and the history of art itself created an essay on some fundamental aspects that have come to embody the collection of the Leal Rich Foundation. These media that I just uh, refer are the media that we work with. The first international exhibition that we've made it was emerged from the, an invitation made by the Loop Festival Barcelona. This Loop edition was focused on collecting time-based the media art. Although the artworks from the Alvish Foundation collection are regularly required by different institutions abroad, this is the first show the Alvish Foundation presents a curatorial project outdoors. That means that we need to go abroad. We need to show our work uh, to get public even more. Writing Diffraction, the name of the exhibition, presented a set of five works at the Centre de la Imar de la Virena, Barcelona. And the last slide, See and See Not. Why I presented this? Because this is, will be the next exhibition, the next opening we are going, going to show. It is a work, this piece that we have here, it is a work in the form of installation, one of the media that we really, really like the most. Video is used as a media, but the viewer does not see any film. Video or moving image. The only image given to do to it, I'm sorry, is the installation itself in space, the videotape VHS and beta, two of the most common formats used in the mass of the technology in the 80s and 90s. So what I wanted to, to tell uh, uh, about this presentation is what I do, even when I'm here, because I was invited to be here, it's to promote the foundation. Promoting the foundation, I promote the, the art pieces. And promoting the art pieces, I promote the artists. And to get the public, it's really very difficult um, to engage the public, because sometimes we have exhibitions with uh, 50 people, but sometimes we have with 800. So it's very difficult to control the public because it depends on the problem of, the pro of each exhibition. What is, uh, instead of having just, uh, instead of promoting only one exhibition, we have to promote the whole. And the whole is the Alrich Foundation, is our work. Thank you.
Bueno, tenía una pregunta para Lian y para, para Cristín, de una pura curiosidad como arquitecto que fui, se ha discutido muchísimo eh, esa figura relativamente nueva de hace unos 10 años del arquitecto estrella, el star architect, que realiza una obra eh, arquitectónica para un museo que se vuelve casi que en contra del museo, puesto que es tan visible por, eh, por la fama de su realizador y por la idiosincrasia de su arquitectura, que en muchas ocasiones hace imposible ver el arte o lo dificulta. Eh, ejemplos notables de eso es, por ejemplo, por ejemplo, Frank Gehry. Y ustedes comparten un mismo arquitecto en dos momentos de su carrera y comparten una situación del edificio con respecto a un paisaje eh, y, y con respecto a un una flujo de público. Quisiera que hablaran un poco de cómo el edificio de Jean Nouvel, en cada caso, ayuda o dificulta esa relación con el público. Yes, that's a very interest, interesting, sorry, an interesting question. Um, I, I would say they're both positive and negative things related to the building and the public, I, and even the works of art. Um, on the positive side, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the artists whom we commission to do works often want to relate to the building in some way and create pieces that, that very strong pieces that are really well integrated into the architecture are, architecture, are visible from the outside. Artists really love the building for its glass box, uh, unconventional, unconventional glass box space. On the other hand, for other types of exhibitions, temporary exhibitions like America Latina, where we have to build walls, then we have to take them down, then we have to build new walls again for the next show. We have to um, put film on the, on the, on the windows to, to cut down on lighting, because of course some works have conservation issues. So I would say there are both positive and negative aspects to the architecture. What about uh, engaging the public, you know, by means of the architecture itself? Well, um, I would say a lot of people come to the foundation because it's a monument in Paris of contemporary architecture, and we actually organize tours once a month for people who want to visit the building with someone from the office of Jean Nouvel who was there when the building was being built, so. And the garden, is it open for the public uh, all the time, or do, do you have to, you know? You have to pay to, pay to enter. To enter, yes. Right, okay. Oh, you don't have to pay to go in the garden in Musée de Kiranli. That's my promotion. <laughs> Um, yes, I think we have um, many kind of problems by building an exhibition in a, in a, in a building designed by Jean Nouvel. Um, we, it's, it's a different situation for us because um, our building is very dark and uh, so it means that it allows to, to present, um, yes, to, um, it's not, the lighting is not a problem. Uh, but it, that's true that we have to build for each exhibition a special space and sometimes we may have the feeling that we have to, to hide the very present, very, yes, very present uh, uh, architecture of Jean Nouvel. So as we have many different space, which is interesting, we may build different kind of atmosphere and etc. Um, but we have to build at each time a new, new atmosphere, new space, new walls. Right. Uh, people sort of, in a way, run into the, the, the building when they are going through the case. So have you taken advantage of this, you know, situation of public just being there to try to entice them into coming into the building? Yes, actually, we, we don't have to, to, um, to try to have public because we, we are, we are one, one of the most popular museums in, in Paris. Um, the public like very much to, to, to go in the garden, to go in the building, and um, many people come to be in the building. Uh, all the, the permanent display and all the museum, actually, all the, uh, the exhibition space and permanent display is designed without any door and any wall, actually. 
So the, um, for the main part of the public, they like to go and to be completely lost in, the, in this space where they, they felt completely non-directed. So. Miguel, um, I, I went to visit the Leal Rios Foundation the other day uh, in Lisbon and I noticed that it was in a sort of a non, um, let's say, non-cultural uh, neighborhood. It was amongst, uh, you know, houses and little shops. And I noticed that you, you don't have any sign on the building. It was, I, I got there because uh, one of your neighbors said, yeah, 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 they are there. But there was, like, no sign. Why is this? Why, if you want to engage the public, why wouldn't you advertise you more? Well, uh, the neighborhood uh, there is uh, actually a factory neighborhood from the 60s. They are abandoned nowadays. And we try to require that building that is just a door. The door is the important thing there. And um, the, peop uh, the, 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 the public that goes there goes because of the Lialrich Foundation itself. And they know it's there. It's what I want to. If you were there, you saw that there was no name at the door even. Nothing. Just a huge door, a great door. And, um, and that's what is attracted. I think what is most important to attract the public is not uh, for us, because we, are, we, 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 we would continue to want to be small, of course, because it's a total private foundation with a private fund. And so um, the idea is uh, if the name of the Alrich Foundation, if the artists, if the works, are important, I know that I can attract public there. It's not because uh, I know that architecture, I, I would like to have an architecture uh, uh, building. I really want it, like both of uh, the, the, the foundations that we work for. But uh, that is what it was not possible, first of all, because uh, it's in a neighborhood just near the airport and because it uh, has other costs. The important thing is nowadays to, nowadays, no, is to construct now an idea, a discourse, and the concept of the collection. And, but uh, at the same time, uh, is it in your plans to engage the neighborhood? Because it's not only industrial. I could see there are many people there. It's not only warehouses. It's already engaged in a way because uh, we communicate to the, 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 to the mayor, for example, and to the magazine of Lisbon, that uh, so the public of that neighborhood, that it was a kind of uh, uh, factory neighborhood, actually, and uh, there is old and new, new people, can visit uh, naturally. Of course, uh, when I said we have only three days uh, uh, with opening doors, actually is not true. This is the formal thing for the people that want to go, like the universities. But actually, they are always knocking the door. Um, um, tenía una pregunta para Christine. Eh, yo tuve la oportunidad de trabajar eh, haciendo la retrospectiva de tres de los artistas que estaban en tu exposición, José Alejandro Restrepo, Oscar Muñoz y, y Miguel Ángel Rojas. Y también he trabajado mucho con, con Juan Manuel Echavarría y... Solamente en el caso de Oscar Muñoz, parecería que no es tan necesaria una contextualización de su trabajo. Es un trabajo que apela eh, como a estrategias bastante eh, casi como poéticas eh, y en, inclusive si tú desconoces el contexto de dónde vienen, eh, tocan como fibras sensibles del público de cualquier parte del mundo. Mientras que la obra de José Alejandro Restrepo en particular y también la de, la de Juan Manuel Echavarría y Miguel Ángel Rojas, tienen muchísimo de relación con el contexto. ¿Cómo, cómo hiciste para, para proveer ese contexto faltante y que pudieran ser leídas estas obras, digamos, sin conocer la situación de, por ejemplo, de violencia, narcotráfico, eh, las desigualdades sociales, la referencia a los mitos, etcétera, que están presentes en las obras de estos artistas? Um, yes, um, I didn't say that how uh, the show was organized. Uh, it was organized at four different solo shows. And um, I decided to, um, to start with the work uh, by Juan Manuel Chavarria. Because um, 
these was pictures, photographic pictures. And um, in a sense, it was a, a good way to start because the people um, had a, um, an encounter with a quite familiar form as a picture on a wall. And after that, we had more difficult works as the Corte de Fleurel. And, um, and they can, um, step by step, go in a more complex uh, situation and more complex works. Uh, so the second part was the works by Jose Alejandro Restrepo. And uh, it was also organized uh, in a rhythm where people can take time to see, uh, especially the videos, to, to sit and to be able to, to reflect about that. And after that, a time to not to have a like, uh, yes. <laughs> and after that, we had uh, the, the works uh, by, uh, by Miguel Angel Rojas and the label um, on, the, on this part with the work uh, by Miguel Angel uh, were uh, written um, um, with the um, citation quotes from Miguel Angel himself because he's working himself and it was very important to have his own voice. And I decided to finish the exhibition with the works uh, by Oscar Munoz because it was also uh, a way to um, um, capitalize all the pictures and all the knowledge that the public um, uh, get in uh, step by step in the exhibition and to finish with the works uh, by Oscar Munoz was a way also to to have a more um, let's say um, a more symbolic uh, sense at the end and so at that time um, we had labels to refer to the history but uh, at this moment I think that the people were uh, able to understand without reading the labels they were not obliged but um, the final piece from Oscar Munoz was uh, this very wide piece called El Testigo. And uh, the, the, the way the space is designed, uh, it was like a, like a circle. It means you finish with El Testigo and the first picture uh, from Juan Manuel Echevarria was also El Testigo. So it was possible to, to go from El Testigo to El Testigo. Nos queda tiempo para algunas preguntas del público. No sé si alguien quisiera hacer una pregunta a nuestros invitados. No, no tan un artista pues que ha tenido ya un recorrido en, en Estados Unidos, que vive en Nueva York, pero quiere estar en esos lugares donde ustedes están. Well, basically, our, our programming, the, um, we, we do support young artists, but our programming is, is determined once a year during a committee meeting, and basically, a young artist who wants to be presented can always send in, um, uh, send in their portfolio, and, and we can take a look at it. But basically, the director determines the programming in with a, with a committee, and will decide if that artist or not will be included in the programming uh, yes okay um, so as a collector for example with the emergent artists what to do we do is like uh, Jose told at the beginning when I'm interested in an artist I follow him from the beginning I mean from his past and I fall into, into the future so this is a way of supporting this artist uh, so that's why our collection doesn't have so many names but uh, we have much more art pieces. Uh, like, for example, we have uh, 50 names, but we don't have 45 uh, uh, artworks. We have maybe 100 artworks. And this is the way we found to, uh, to promote the artist and to help him and to support him. Um, just to answer from a um, young artist uh, in the Musée du Camorlie, we, uh, we are dedicated to the 
art from Africa, America, Asia, and, and Pacific. And um, we, have, um, we have a residency program, which is not only dedicated to young artists, but where young artists can apply, it's completely open. And we select each year three artists to make a special, a special project. And the project come after that in the collection. And uh, we also have a Biennale especially dedicated to young photography from all over the world. And um, it is now in this, this moment in the, in the museum. And it is the fifth edition. So it means that we were able from the beginning to show 300 uh, photographers, especially young photographers. La, me, en, en mi experiencia trabajando dentro y fuera de instituciones, lo que he visto es que casi nunca un uh, dossier que llega sin ser solicitado es realmente tenido en cuenta. Y eso es una verdad y de, de pronto aquí mis colegas me pueden corregir, pero es muy raro que los dossiers de los montones de dossiers que llegan eh, se ha escogido un artista para darle una exposición. Eh, pienso que muchas personas que trabajan al interior de museos, inclusive eh, eh, curadores, eh, le dicen al artista, manda un dossier y lo miraremos, pero la mayoría de esos dossiers nunca son mirados con detenimiento eh, y es como generar una falsa expectativa. La experiencia que yo he tenido es que los curadores que trabajan en instituciones o inclusive los que trabajamos como independientes estamos mirando el arte, interesándonos por algo y proponiéndoselo a nuestros colegas y de ahí surgen las exposiciones, casi nunca surgen de una, de una, de una propuesta no solicitada. Eso es, creo, una verdad del medio artístico, salvo cuando está programáticamente concebido así, o sea, una, una convocatoria abierta para que la gente mande los dossiers y en ese caso sí que se miran con cuidado los dossiers, pero cuando no son solicitados por lo general, esos dossiers no van a llegar a los comités de programación de los museos. Thank you. Uh, you were saying that the, the, regarding the, muse, the exhibition uh, Nocturnes de, la, de Colombia, uh, I, I would like to know why you chose the topic uh, uh, around the, 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 the violence when uh, Colombia can be well known around the world for, for other areas in, in our culture. And I think uh, this exhibition, Arbo, is an example of that. Okay, the, um, the subject was not the violence. The idea was to, um, to, uh, to show these works because I say we had the, this Biennale dedicated to young photography. And um, I, um, we experienced four edition of this, this Biennale. And um, I felt that it was important to to show that in this, uh, all these countries there were also major artists and established artists. And uh, I went in Colombia five years ago. I was very impressed by the, the works, by these artists. And I suggested to have this exhibition to give a chance to the French public to see the works as works of art. I didn't choose the pieces as a subject. I wanted to present the artist. And as I'm a, I'm, creator, I'm creator of photography, I was very interested in the way that these artists especially use, um, use the photographic image through the different installation, video, and photography. So I organize and I choose the different pieces with that idea. It means uh, the violence and the, 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 the question of violence was there, but was not the subject and was not the, the, um, the subject of each piece. But I, I felt that the public and especially the, the journalist may understand that it could be the subject. That's why we wrote, and I was very um, 
worrying about the different text I wrote to be sure that the people understand that we were not talking about a subject which could be the violence, but we were talking about art and people and artists um, expressing different things about this, the, the, the situation in Colombia also, including violence, but not, not, not only. Right? Thank you. Si la idea es acercar al público, al museo, a la fundación, ¿cómo influye la ubicación en el caso en Lisboa, que está en un lugar apartado o en un lugar residencial? ¿Cómo influye el lugar y también, la, o sea, la ubicación del lugar y cómo influye el hecho de que en algunos se cobre la entrada cuando se pretende acercar al público en general? Bueno, no... No voy a responder por ellos, pero eh, en algunos museos grandes y por ejemplo en una ciudad como París, que es una de las ciudades más visitadas del mundo, eh, la, el flujo de público es enorme y, y eh, se cobra la entrada porque por lo general esos dineros se, re, se, digamos, se revierten en, en el, la función social de la institución, pero yo no pensaría que si no se cobrara simplemente no se podría caminar por la, por, por, de la cantidad de público que tendrían. Estoy solamente especulando, pero, pero sí, hay algunos museos que no necesitan atraer al público, sino más bien in, inventar maneras de que la experiencia de ese público que sí va sea mucho más significativa que simplemente pasar, como pasa mucha gente, por museos como el Louvre o el, el Pompidou o el Guggenheim, que pasan como una especie de visita obligada turística y no tienen el tiempo ni la posibilidad de tener una experiencia más significativa con el arte.